All right, children, we will dismiss you at this time if you want to go with Miss Anya to Children's Church. Any of our little ones that want to head downstairs, now's the time to do it. We will rally right over there. What a great scene that is right there. You got that on you? You got it? All right. Well, let's all open together to the book of Joshua, shall we? And if you would like to read along with us this morning, you can find the book of Joshua on page 178 of the Pew Bibles in front of you. We are going to read verses 1 to 9, and Lord willing, I will pick up where we leave off this morning uh, on Sunday evening next week. We'll pick up preaching through the book of Joshua on Sunday evenings next week. So if the Lord blesses you this morning, maybe you can join us next week on Sunday evenings. We're going to read verses 1 to 9, but before we do, let me say a couple things. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to Michael for asking me to preach this morning. I'm, I'm always honored to preach on Sunday mornings. I cherish the, the times that I've been able to be with you um, on Sunday mornings preaching the Word. But, but to preach on this Sunday morning is a special honor. You know, today is the first Sunday in what we might call the transition. So we're all transitioning. You know, we are, if you think about it, if I can put a big picture lens on it, we are transitioning from the past to the future. And that means we're transitioning from life together under Richard to life together under Michael. And I will have the privilege of working with both men. Now, I don't think I have to tell any of you this, but transitions are not easy. In fact, as I look back on all the transitions of my life, and they seem to come about every four or five years. I've been, and so here we are again, four and a half years here at Third Presbyterian, and here comes another one. And when I look back on all the transitions in my life, I, all I can say is that they're hard. You know, transitions are hard. When we transition in life, you know, we do feel unstable. We do feel uncertain. Transitions are not easy. But here's what I want to say. Transitions are not easy, but they can be successful. They're not easy but they can be successful. And so I have one question before we read, and that is, do we all want to see a successful transition? If we do, then we all do well to approach our Father's Word in the book of Joshua in the first nine verses with a soft and receptive heart. So to that end and in that spirit, let us stand to hear the reading of our Father's Word. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, oh, help us to receive the reading and preaching of your word. Make clear, O Lord, that these are your words, and you are the only one who can empower them and make them rest on hearts and minds in the way that they need to. And Father, I do pray for these dear friends as we have gathered together here at the start of a new year, at the start of a new era in the life of Third Presbyterian Church. and. What we need most is a fresh message from God. And it comes from the inspired words of your book. And so I pray that as I preach, you would preach. And so would you help me, Lord, to be faithful to your words, to build your people up, and to bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have any of you ever seen the movie Apollo 13? Came out about 25 years ago. I know, right? 25 years ago, Apollo 13, thereabouts. I think most of us may have seen it, but in case you haven't, it, it was about the seventh man mission of the Apollo space program. Three astronauts. Jack Swigert, Fred Hayes, and Jim Lovell, they all took off from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida on April 11th, 1970. If you know the story, you know that these three men were headed for the moon. It was a part of the Apollo program. And so Apollo 8, well, excuse me, was it Apollo 12? I should know my history. One of those two, they landed on the moon. So they were going to go again to the moon in Apollo 13, but when the oxygen tanks exploded, then these three men, Jack Swigert, Fred Hayes, and Jim Lovell, they found themselves in a fight for their lives just to return safely home. And so the film is about the story of how they made it safely home. And there's a scene in that movie which I think illustrates the blessing that our Lord is holding out to us this morning. And the scene illustrates the blessing that the book of Joshua can lay out to us this morning for where we are in life and, and as a church. And if you've seen the movie, you, you might remember this scene. Jim Lovell's wife, Marilyn, is in her living room. And she's watching her husband, Jim, on the TV. And it's a rerun of an old interview between Jim and a, and a journalist. And the journalist had asked Jim, is there a specific instance when you were in an airplane emergency and you can recall fear? And that's when Jim tells 
the interviewer a story. He says, once I was in a banshee, that's a fighter jet. I was in a banshee at night in combat conditions, which means that he didn't have his lights on on the side of the aircraft. And he said, I'm looking down at a big black ocean. And then zap, everything goes out. I have no instruments. I can't see. It's in pitch black darkness. And he said in that interview, I'm thinking about ditching. I'm thinking about ditching the aircraft and just seeing what can happen in the ocean. And then he said, I look down and in the darkness there's this green trail. And he said it was like a long carpet and it was the algae, this phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship. And it was just this long green carpet and he said it was leading me home. You know, transitions can sometimes feel like flying an airplane at night without any instruments. Because I fly planes all the time and I know what that's like. <laughs> so, they feel like that. We lose our bearings and we think about ditching. But before we ditch, I would like us to consider the book of Joshua and particularly these first nine verses. This book is a green trail. It's a long carpet and it is leading home. And by home I mean it is showing us the way to a successful transition. And I believe that with all my heart. That in this book we have what we need to make the next few days, weeks, months, years, and decades successful. And that trail begins here in the verses that we read together. And if I could sum up what I hear the Spirit of God saying through these nine verses, I, I'd put it like this. Any transition in life, whether it's from one pastor to another, one job to another, one state of life to another, one address to another, any transition in life will be successful if you execute the Lord's plan, if you rely on the Lord's Spirit, and if you keep the Lord's charge. If you execute the Lord's plan, and I will show you the Lord's plan in verses 1 to 4. If you rely on the Lord's Spirit, the very same Spirit who was with Moses and who was with Joshua and who is in you, if you rely on that Spirit, and then if you will keep this one charge, be strong, have courage. If you can do that, you can make it through a hard transition successfully in any, at any point in your life. So let's dig in. Let's look at the Lord's plan here in verses 1 to 4. Now, I don't know how often you read or study the book of Joshua. Maybe often, maybe not. And, but I think for most Christians this is not um, a part of the Bible that we come across very often. We don't study it very often. We don't read it very often. And maybe one reason that is, is because we're not real sure what to do with it. I mean, Joshua is about a land. But it's a land in which none of us live <laughs> and which most of us will never see. It's about the land of Canaan or the land of present day Israel. So I think when we come to this book, most of us know that it's important because it's in the Bible, but we have a hard time seeing how it is important or why is it is important or more than that, how it reaches its fingers down into our heart and into our gut and our mind and has a blessing. I think that can be hard sometimes to see. So if you look with me at the first four verses, what you got here 
is an ancient witness that our Father in Heaven has a plan. And His plan, in His own words, is to bless the nations. And the nations in the Bible are not just countries, but ethnic groups of people. He has a plan to bless every ethnic group on planet Earth. And he's going to do that through the Jewish people. The first thing he's going to do is create the Jewish people out of one man and a dead womb. And then this people is going to become a nation. And through this nation, he has a blessing to bring to you and me. Now, eventually, this blessing would mean that he was going to deal with the sin of the human race through a single Jewish man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so when you come to the book of Joshua, and you'll pick up, okay, this is about a land, they're, the people of God are going to inherit it, okay, they've been told they're going to have that promise, okay, got it. Why does that matter? <laughs> Why is this land so important to God's plan? Because God's plan is to reign on planet Earth from a spot within this land. I mean, God's intent is to come down and live with you. As it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. I mean, God's mission is to live with you, to enjoy you, to share all that He has to give you. But his intent is to do that on earth, as in heaven. Well, which part? <laughs> if it's on earth, which part of the earth? Well, to start in this land, this land recorded and spoken about in the book of Joshua, there's a spot within this land from which God will reign for eternity. And that spot is Jerusalem. Now, with respect to transition, I am convinced that the transition between from Moses to Joshua went so well because both Joshua and Israel never let God's plan out of their sight. I mean, what, what, how did this go so well? And as we go forward more, in the passage, I'll show you how it went well and why it went well. But why did it go so well? There's something to be learned here. There's wisdom here. Why did this go so well? This is a beautiful transition after a 40-year ministry that was unprecedented. How did this go so well? Joshua is praying. And God says to him, you do what I've already told you to do. You know my plan. You know that my intent is to give your people, to give this people this land. You hold on to that plan and you execute it. I'm not asking you, Joshua, to come up with your own plan. I'm not asking you to reinvent the wheel. I'm asking you to do what I've already revealed. So God's plan is to bless the nations through Israel. And in New Testament words, that means to spread the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. To David next door. To the gentleman at the Smoothie King. To the schools and the neighborhoods that you live in, that your grandchildren attend, that your children attend. God's plan is to spread the blessing recorded in this book to them. And when you hold on to that, transitions go well in any part of life. And you know, I was thinking about uh, this this week, and that reminds me of a story. I had a Sunday school teacher in the third grade who um, was wonderful. He was a very highly respected man in the community of Birmingham. 
And I remember him teaching me the Bible every single week in the third grade. And he gave out trophies for anybody who could uh, recite all 66 books of the Bible. And that trophy is somewhere in my parents' attic. So I got a trophy for that. And this was a godly man. He's, I still think about him now. And, and he leaves such a godly impression on me. About 12 years later, I saw him at an event that my mother had put on. And I, w I had become a Christian. I don't know that I was quite in ministry yet. But I was grateful for this man and here is ministry. And I saw him. I said, well, are you still at such and such a church? And he said, no. I said, well, where are you now? He goes, well, I'm at such and such a church. I said, why did, why did you do that? He said, I needed a mission. I needed to be a part of something bigger than the local church. I needed to be a part of God's big plan. And I needed a place to execute it. And I think about that and say, and, and I see two things. One, uniting together around God's plan to bless the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ. That is a thrilling way to do church. I mean, it's thrilling, it's fun, it's exciting, because you're not real sure what's going to happen. Who's going to come in the door? Who's going to receive the message? You don't know. It's thrilling, it's exciting. It's what church ought to be about. So I, when I look at this Sunday school teacher, I see that. But you know what I also see? That when God's plan moves from being primary to being secondary, a local church loses its best people. You lose your best people when they don't have a chance to feed on the mission of God week in and week out. What is teaching for? What is preaching for? What is Sunday school for? What is worship for? To give you what you need to get out there, get uncomfortable, have a conversation, and give your life to something that matters. Joshua never let that go, and that's why the people followed him. He didn't execute his own plan. He executed God's plan, and the people followed him. And that encourages me, and I hope it encourages you. Now, you might say, well, how could a little church like us have global impact? I mean, the mission of God is a global plan. It and I believe in local plans, and that's a part of it, but it's not the, the core of it. The core of it is that the local church is God's way of spreading His reign on the earth to its furthermost parts. It's a global plan. So, so I don't, but how, I mean, you might be sitting there saying, well, okay, cool preacher. But how can a little church like us have global impact? And, you know, believe it or not, that's an easy one. <laughs> it really is. Because the way to have global impact is to rely on the Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord. And you know, I last week I was sitting where you sit. I was sitting right there where my father is with Sam. And, and I was in the service and the thought came to me, you know, how do we recognize the Spirit of God? How, 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 do I, how do you know what's God's doing? I mean, in Joshua's day, I mean, he's sitting there and he's about to follow Moses. And he's about to dispossess local tribes who were cruel, barbaric, pagan, vicious. And God says, go in and take what's theirs. And he's thinking, okay, <laughs> how's that going to happen? But not only that, how are all these people going to follow me into that situation? <laughs> how would the nation know that the Lord Almighty was, as he says in verse 5, with Joshua, just as he was with Moses? How would they know that? They would see... 
similar things that they had seen in Moses' day. They would see similar displays of divine power and authority. And if you've ever been through the book of Joshua, you know this. The waters would part again. The people of God would see signs and wonders again. The very same things that they had seen under Moses' leadership, they would see under Joshua's leadership. They would see displays of the power and spirit of God. And so I, when I talk, or when Michael talks, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, or in our church, or in our fellowship, or in the world, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of a big wind turbine. Everybody know what a wind turbine is? It looks like a big windmill. It's this gigantic uh, post, and it's got these huge propellers on it. So when I talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and relying on the Holy Spirit, he, practically, here's what I'm talking about. You think of a big wind turbine. Now what's a big wind turbine? Basically, man builds a structure for the benefit of the community. I mean, nobody goes out in their backyard and a, builds a wind turbine because it's trendy or for aesthetic effect. Nobody does it to gather people per se. They don't do it to look good. They do it to benefit the community. So man builds a structure for the distinct and specific purpose of benefiting the community. Then what happens? God supplies the power. Man builds a structure. God supplies the power. That's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is like. Man builds the structure, God supplies the power. Man builds the structure for the benefit of the community, and God supplies the power to make it work. So it is God's doing and man's doing. The Holy Spirit works through people. He works through Christians. He works through sessions. He works through diaconates. He works through ministers. He works through people. And what does this group of people need to do now? Well, right now, we need to build, we need to build wind turbines. I mean, right now, in the days ahead, there are some structures that we need to build. And we need to build them for the benefit of this community. And when I say this community, I mean us. But I also mean those that Jesus referred to when he said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. We need to build some wind turbines. But listen very carefully to me. When we build these things, we will rely on God's Spirit. We will rely on Him to supply the power to make it all work. And Paul would say it like this, we all got a plant. We all got to water. But then we're going to wait and we're going to let God supply the growth. That's what it looks like to rely on the Spirit of God. We're going to get busy. There's a lot of work to do. And everybody's got to pull their weight. And we've got to build some things. But we are not replacing God. We are working with God. <laughs> we are working with His Spirit. And we are trusting Him for the source of and the power to make it all work. So, starting now, let's all do this. Let's execute the Lord's plan. You know, let's bless the nations. I mean, we live in a community that is for sure the most diverse in our entire state. We have more opportunity to reach the nations for where we are than any other than any other church in town, maybe. So let's execute the Lord's plan. Let's bless the nations. Let's rely on the Lord's Spirit to empower our efforts. And then there's one more thing. Let's keep the charge written in verses 6 to 9. Verses 6 to 9, there's a charge here. Be strong. Have courage. Be strong, Joshua. 
Be firm. Now notice this. <laughs> this is not just being strong and firm, period. It is being strong and firm to a specific end. To what end? To the doing of the word. Be strong and be firm. You might even phrase it this way. Be fierce in your heart in the task of doing the word. Verse 7, only be strong, be very courageous, that you might keep doing all this law which Moses my servant commanded you. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. That you may have success in everywhere that you shall go. You know, one of the things that I love most about you all is that you're doers. And I scan the crowd, and there's not many people that I don't know or haven't had a conversation with, and you're doers. I like that about you. I love that about you. And when I say doers, what I mean by that is you're not here to be served on the whole. You're here to serve. And let me ask you this. If that's true of you, and I hope it is, I hope that you come to Third Presbyterian every week to be with God and to be energized and refreshed, but to go out and to serve God. Let me ask this question. So what does service to God look like right now? For, th for, this is, for this church as a body, as a whole, what does service, doing the Word, look like right now? It looks like receiving Michael and Lisa Brock. That's doing the Word. That's being strong. That's being courageous. That's doing the Word of God. I can prove it. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Do you know who said that? Jesus Christ. That's doing the word. Now, I know that that is going to take strength. I know that that is not easy. I know that that is going to take courage. I know that. But you know who else knows that? God knows that. God knows that. And that's why His word to you is, I'm giving you a charge. Have strength. Have courage. Be firm in your heart and your commitment to do and to be what you already are, doers of the Word. Doers of what Word? What I just read, John 13, 20. He who or she who receives the one I send receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. All right. Let's get real practical for one second and then I'm about to end. Do you know what Jesus Christ just said? How you treat them is how you treat him. That's what he just said. How you treat me, how you treat one another, as you come to one another in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is how you treat God. There's no difference according to Jesus Christ. Now I know that takes strength. I know that takes courage. And so let me end by saying, look, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We all have to exhibit the strength and courage that we need to make this transition successful. And so let me end with this. If you've ever read the book of Joshua cover to cover, you find something striking. Or at least it's striking to me. So Moses was the greatest leader in the history of the Jewish nation. I mean, that's what the book of Deuteronomy says. 
And you know, we don't have a single comment in the entire book to this effect. Well, Moses never did it like that. You know, why can't Joshua be more like Moses? That would be easy to say. He's the greatest leader in the history of the nation. I'm excluding the Lord Jesus because he, he is the God of the nation. Moses, to this day, is the greatest leader in the history of the Jewish people. And you don't have a single comment like that. And this was not an easy transition, but it was unbelievably successful. Why? Because they executed the Lord's plan, they relied on the Lord's spirit, and they kept the Lord's charge. They had to make a decision. Who do I love most? Who am I most committed to? And if the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ, then right now, we're all going to give ourselves to this word and say we are going to exhibit the strength and the courage that it will take to make this transition successful. And, you know, I was thinking, how in the world do you end this sermon? And all I really knew to say was, verse 5, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You know, throughout this transition, you might feel a lot of things. But one thing I hope that you won't forget is that I am with you, for whatever that means, and whatever that's worth. I am with you. Michael is with you. But more than all of that, God is with you. God is with you. God is with us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I give you thanks for your word. And when it's handled properly, it penetrates into our heart. It penetrates into our bones. And it divides the thoughts of the mind. And it convicts us. But oh Lord, I pray that my friends here would see that this is a good word. That the things that we've heard this morning from your mouth are a path leading home. They're a path leading to life. And I pray that your spirit would work now. And we would all together join arm in arm and take this path. And walk it. Day in, day out week in and week out, and we would watch you do signs and wonders in our midst. We would watch you do things in our fellowship that you did in the days of Joshua, that you would plant your spirit in a place, and that the fear and dread of the Lord would fall upon our neighbors, and that many might come to enter the kingdom of God and be born again and live forever with you on earth as in heaven. And we pray this all in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.